Today's video, we're going over clinical examination of femoral acetabular impingement syndrome. Woo! <laughs> According to research by Clohesi et al., the average patient with FAI takes about three years to get a definitive diagnosis from symptom onset to getting that diagnosis. You usually have to see on average 4.2 different healthcare providers before they get that diagnosis. Now, obviously this is a bad reflection on us as physical therapists, folks are supposed to be evaluating and diagnosing FAI accurately. So in today's video, we're going over how we evaluate and diagnose folks that may have FAI. What's up guys? My name is Dan Pope from Fitness Pain Free. I'm a strength coach and a physical therapist. We have helped to make thousands of incredible coaches and clinicians. There are online courses, communities, and mentoring programs. The goals of today's video, to make you 1% better. So FAI is a motion-related clinical disorder of the hip with a triad of symptoms, clinical signs, as well as imaging findings. It represents symptomatic premature contact between the ball or femoral head and socket or acetabulum of the hip. Now this definition is from the Warwick Agreement in 2016, and the reason why we needed a better diagnosis is that you can have a lot of asymptomatic findings. Let's say you have cam morphology, or pincer morphology, or hip labral tear, and you may have the absence of symptoms and clinical signs. So we need to make sure that we have symptoms like pain, clinical signs like a fade ear, as well as radiologic findings like an x-ray showing cam or pincer morphology. FAI is one of the most common hip disorders. It's particularly common in younger athletes and particularly in those athletes in high intensity sports, things like hockey, skiing, basketball, and soccer. In terms of pain location, most folks will have pain right in the front or medial, although that varies from patient to patient. You may have some athletes to give you the good old C sign, so make a C sign with their hand and they'll grab the front lateral portion of their hip and this is where their pain is. And lastly, despite most of these folks having pain in the front or medial side of the hip, some folks are gonna have pain more on the side of the hip, back of the hip, maybe the lower back, or sending down through the thigh and the knee. Usually this is going to be exacerbated by prolonged exercise or participation in sports. But you also see folks that hurt in prolonged postures, the big one being sitting. So I always ask my potential FAI patients, does it hurt to sit in a car for a long period of time? Particularly if it's a low car, like a sports car. The, the taller cars, like SUV, sometimes doesn't provoke their symptoms because they're not in enough hip flexion. But patients will typically say it hurts to sit for a long time. So pain isn't always the only symptom. A lot of these folks will say they have some clicking, catching, buckling, giving way. Some folks will also complain of stiffness or a lack of range of motion at the hip. All right, let's move on to some objective findings. What do you want to look for objectively in your uh, patients with suspect FAI? The first is a loss of range of motion or pain during range of motion. The big ones you want to check out are going to be hip flexion and hip internal rotation. So first what I'll do is I'll take Kyle's leg up, relax for me, and I'll passively go up to the point where either Kyle says, yes, that's where my pain starts, or where I feel like there's no more range of motion. Now obviously we can check on the other side to see if there's a difference. The other one we will look at is hip internal rotation range of motion. So I come up to 90 and I go into internal rotation. A, this could be painful. B, it could be limited. Now why is this? When I go into hip flexion, internal rotation, I am engaging the cam morphology or the pincer morphology. So if I have a symptomatic painful hip, then those are the motions are usually limited or painful. So make sure you assess side to side. The second piece is that it's good to have these numbers to see if you're making progress over the course of time. Let's say Kyle comes in, hip is really killing him, we bring him up, he hurts around 80, over the course of time, he starts to make some progress. Now we get to 110 before it starts to hurt. We can say that's good progress from moving in the right direction. Okay, moving on to special tests. One thing I will say about special tests is that if you have a patient with a very aggravated hip, you do some more of these aggressive special tests, you can really hurt them. So keep in mind that a positive special test is gonna be the reproduction of your patient's familiar symptoms. So if they start to feel pain when we go into flexion and you wanna do a fade here, you don't have to do the whole test, right? So essentially, if I bring Kyle's leg up and I wanna do a fader test, I wanna go into flexion, adduction, turn rotation, and it starts to hurt as I go here, I don't need to crank it. I don't need to go all the way over here. I've just seen a lot of folks who get their hip a lot more painful after seeing a provider that runs them through 10 different special tests, all of which aggravates the hip further. Anterior impingement test. We have Kyle here lying on his back. I'm going to flex his hip to 90. From here, I go into maximal internal rotation, and I go into maximal hip adduction. A positive special test is gonna be the reproduction of the patient's familiar symptoms. Fadier test. We're gonna have Kyle on his back here. We're gonna go into simultaneous hip flexion, internal rotation, and hip adduction, like so. 
and a positive special test would be the reproduction of the patient's familiar symptoms. What I will say is don't crank this aggressively if you're starting to get symptoms down here. It's already positive. Hip internal rotation range of motion testing in neutral. You have your patient laying on their belly here. You're going to flex those knees to 90 degrees. And from here, we're going to go maximal internal rotation on both sides. So Kyle, in prone here, knees are together. From here, we're going to bend the knees to 90 and maximally internally rotate on both sides. So what we're looking for is there a substantial difference in range of motion from left to right. So the side that's stiffer and or producing familiar symptoms will be a positive special test for labral pathology of the hip. Favorite test, so Kyle here is in supine. We're going to take patient's leg. We're going to take the heel, make sure we put it above the kneecap because this can be a little bit aggravating if you place it right on that kneecap. And from here, we go into hip extension, horizontal abduction and extension. A positive special test would be the reproduction of the patient's familiar symptoms or major restriction range of motion left to right. Scour test, we're essentially going to take Kyle's leg here. I'm going to flex up to 90. I'm going to apply an axial load. So essentially I'm pushing straight down through the leg. And from here, I'm going to go to flexion, into flexion and internal rotation scouring the ball against the socket. I'm gonna do the same axial load, going into flexion, external rotation. You can do a few passes of this, but I will say this can be very provocative in some patients. So as soon as it starts to hurt, pause a special test, reproducing the patient's familiar symptoms. Internal rotation over pressure test. So essentially we're gonna take Kyle here, I'm gonna flex him up to 90. I'm gonna apply an axial load here. And once I have the axial load, I'm gonna go into hip flexion as well as hip internal rotation. The positive special test is going to be reproduction of the patient's familiar symptoms. Yes, Kyle doesn't have a lot of internal rotation here. <laughs> Resisted straight leg raise test. Let's have you lift your leg up to about 45 degrees here. And from here, I'm going to press down. Don't let me move you. Go ahead and push nice and strong. Push, 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 and relax. A positive special test would be the reproduction of the patient's familiar symptoms, indicating some sort of labral pathology. Thomas test. So we're gonna have Kyle on the edge of the table here. We wanna actually kind of have the butt off the edge a little bit. And from here, lay all the way back and then grab onto both of your knees. Let's bring up both. There you go. Yep, all the way back. And from here, hug this one. Let this one go all the way down towards the floor. Yep. And this reproduces the patient's familiar symptoms. That'll be a positive special test. So the failure test is going to compress the hip joint, creating symptoms. The Thomas test is going to stretch the hip joint. So if you have some sort of anterior labral pathology, when you go into a Thomas test position, it's going to pull that tear apart. And that's the reason why it might be a good test for folks who have labral pathology. And one way that greatly improves both the sensitivity and the specificity of the Thomas test is to have your phone out on the floor. And as this foot goes down, have your patient hit the like button with their big toe. Good job. Next, we'll talk a little about differential diagnosis. And the first two things I want to talk about are avascular necrosis and hip dysplasia. Now, here's the issue with these two pathologies. They present very, very similarly to FAI. So if your patient's not getting better in around 12 weeks after trialing physical therapy, you want to send the patient back to the surgeon, back to the physician, get some more imaging, figure out what the heck is going on in the hip. The other two important things to do a really good job from a differential diagnosis perspective is going to be a bone stress injury as well as hip osteoarthritis. So for bone stress injuries, generally speaking, these are more common in runners and it hurts to load the leg. When you think about someone who has FAI, it's typically the positions of flexion, internal rotation that hurts. The problem with the bone stress injury is it does present pretty similarly to FAI, but this is kind of an emergency situation. If you have your athlete continue to work through that, you can have an emergency on your hand if that thing fully breaks, right? For hip arthritis, it also presents very similarly as well. The only main difference is that you'll usually see older folks with this. So if someone has a bunch of positive special tests for FAI, but they're above the age of 40, I start thinking this may be more hip osteoarthritis. The other piece with hip OA is these folks typically have more stiffness and more loss of range of motion, particularly into hip internal rotation. Snapping hip syndrome. Generally speaking, with this syndrome, the primary complaint is a painful snapping, usually in the front or the side of the hip. Now, with FAI, we can also have clicking and popping. So how do you tell the difference between these two? So generally speaking, with a snapping hip, you have the snapping, at least in the front portion of the hip, by doing any sort of resisted hip flexion. Let's have you do a few repetitions here. These patients will also say, you can relax for a second, my hip snaps when I'm doing dead bugs. And the reason being is because when you raise your leg under some sort of resistance or just the weight of your leg, your hip flexors are active, specifically the psoas. So the psoas tendon crosses right over the A 
IIS, which is a bony prominence that sticks out like this. So if you flex your psoas, it's taut like a band, snaps over top of that bony prominence, and it can create symptoms. So usually this will be positive when you do this with your patients. You even put your fingers right over that. But do keep in mind, when someone has a snapping hip, it could potentially be FAI as well. You can also have snapping hip on the side of the hip. So essentially it's have you lay on your side here, Kyle. And when Kyle goes into hip flexion and extension, so go ahead and do a few repetitions right here, you may even see popping of the IT band over the greater trochanter. So these folks will usually say they have pain right over the side of the hip. It's usually tender to palpation. Sometimes you can see it or feel that snapping in that region. That'll help to differentiate it from FAI. Next, we want to be on a lookout for lumbar radiculopathy. I did have a patient one time that was scheduled to go have FAI surgery. He came in to see me prior because he was hurting so bad. Turns out he had a very, very symptomatic lumbar radiculopathy. However, they did some imaging that showed he had FAI pathology as well. We treated the back, he got better. So it's really important to do a good job with differential diagnosis for lumbar radicular pain as well. So this one's easy. We can just do dermatomal and myotomal tests as well as reflexes. We can also just go through a slump test. So essentially we'll have Kyle sitting on the edge here. I want you to slump down from your spine, head down as well. Go ahead and kick one leg out straight. Good, and then just have your doors to flex. Good, and relax. And this reproduces the patient's familiar symptoms. We're starting to think more uh, radicular low back pain. You can also do a straight leg raise test. Let's so have you lay on your back. Good, and on that painful side, let's go ahead and straighten this one out too. I'll go into end range dorsiflexion here. I'll keep this leg straight, and I'll just bring the leg all the way up until we can't go anymore, or this brings on the patient's familiar symptoms. So when I do a straight leg raise here, I'm not going into a ton of hip flexion or internal rotation, rotation range of motion, but I am really stretching those nerves all along. So if this is a positive special test, I'm thinking this is more of a dick through the back pain. The next big differential diagnosis, and this is the area where I see clinicians mess up the most, is diagnosing FAI as some sort of strain injury or some sort of tendinopathy, right? So if you do uh, hip flexor testing and you have pain in the front side of the hip, so think about the resistance straight leg raise test and it hurts, that could be a hip flexor strain or it could be FAI. So one of the big differentiators is how the injury occurred. So strains tend to happen acutely. So think about kicking a soccer ball as hard as you can. You can strain your hip flexors. This is something that kind of came on slowly over the course of time. That's probably more FAI or some tendinopathy. The other giveaway is tenderness to palpation. So if you have an area that's very tender to palpation, then chances are that's going to be more of a tendinopathy or a strain injury. For folks who have FAI, they have a hard time putting their hand on the pain. Don't get me wrong, when you have FAI, sometimes the muscle's a little more tender on the painful side compared to the non-painful side, but it's not like you have this um, one spot where all your pain is, where you can tell, just like you would, you would have it with a strain or a tendinopathy. So you need to be really good at palpating. And essentially, we have Kyle right here laying on his back, and the first thing you want to find is ASIS. So essentially, the front part of the hip has bony prominence right here, ASIS, and I find his kneecap. And right between those two, we're gonna have the rectus femoris goes all the way down. So I can go straight down, palpate along this, and see if that reproduces the patient's very familiar symptoms, right? Right off of the ASIS and attaching to it is your sartorius. If you're having a hard time feeling this muscle, go ahead and flex your leg a little bit, and then come right back down again. It'll pop right into your fingers. And again, it's right off of the ASIS. And this muscle comes down and across, goes on the inside of the knee, right? So that's what you feel right below the ASIS and a little bit medially. From here, I'm gonna have you take your leg out to the side a little bit. Yep, and then relax back down. We know where the inguinal ligament is, right through this area. If I go medial to the uh, sartorius, but I go inferior to the inguinal canal, the next thing we go on is the psoas major. So if there's a lot of tenderness to palpation, maybe you're dealing with a psoas tendonitis or some sort of tendinopathy. If we keep on going medial to that, but below the inguinal ligament, you should feel a pulse. That's the femoral artery. If we move medial to that, you're on your pectineus. If we keep on creeping down further and further, we go across a ropey cord, that's your adductor longus. And if I go beyond that, it's gonna be your adductor magnus. And essentially, if anywhere along there, and we're palpating, it's reproducing the same exact symptoms the patient came in for, chances are you have either a strain or a tendinopathy of that given muscle or tendon and not FAI. Next, we want to be to look out for gluteal tendinopathy. Now remember we just said when folks have FAI, they could have lateral pain. But another pathology that gives you lateral pain is gluteal tendinopathy. And we can differential diagnose this in a few different ways. The first of which is going to be, excuse me, going to be doing a resisted hip abduction. Go ahead and push up into my resistance here. Is that reproducing your familiar symptoms? 
Oh boy, gluteal tendinopathy. The other thing is tenderness to palpation. So essentially, if I go ahead and palpate on the greater trochanter and I go over this a few times, that is reproducing the patient's familiar symptoms, that will be a positive special test. But the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of folks with FAI also have gluteal tendinopathy. So oftentimes, not only are you treating the FAI, you're also treating the symptomatic gluteal tendinopathy along with it. All right, now you're an expert diagnosing FAI. Oftentimes, folks think that hip flexor strains are FAI and vice versa. Well, here's the thing. I have a full video. And we break down hip flexor strains, how to diagnose them so you can treat them accurately. Kyle, again, has placed his video up in the corner right there. Go ahead and click on that, and we'll see you there.